Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today I have a special guest. Today I'm hosting Ryan Kramer. Ryan is the partnership manager at Ping Pong Payments, which is a global payment processing platform. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Yoni. It's awesome to speak with your audience and talk to you. Awesome, our pleasure to have you. Um, all right, so today's episode is really gonna be all about you, the episode of Ryan Kramer. So you're gonna share with us, you know, who are you, where were you born, where'd you grow up, uh, Where'd you go to school? Um, yeah. How'd you begin your professional career? And then all the way to how you got to the world of e-commerce. So I guess without further ado, let's jump right into it. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird story I love telling to people because I think every person's journey is never the same, obviously. So my road path kind of started with failure um, and it came when I started off college. My first job actually was working in the newspaper industry. So I was a new business development. I had to go door to door collecting business cards, selling solutions back in, gosh, this was 2012. Hold and on, let, let me, would, yeah, yeah, so yeah, before we ahead. jump right into the business uh, ups and downs, let's start with even more. Let's give them, I want them more. Go backwards even further, yeah. Yeah, where were you born? So, where'd you grow up? Give us some context of, of you know, your, your you know, uh, your progression. Yeah, I'll, I'll rewind farther. So I was born in Texas. Uh, oh. I'm at, by birth, I uh, was born in Plano, Texas. Uh, when That's I was, uh, like, Frito-Lay, right? Yeah, Frito Lay, Dr. Potato Pepper. Chips. Yeah, just I think it's either Pepsico. it's a suburb of uh, yeah Dallas, Texas. So technically Southern, if I if I were to classify that. But I grew up in Indiana, so I moved there in, to Indiana when I was around six years old. So majority of my life I spent in the Midwest, and then um, from an early age I actually was very involved. I was the oldest of five, so I'm part of a big Catholic family. Um, was very involved in sports. I played baseball when I was three, all the way till I was 18 in high school and uh, won a state championship my junior year of high school. So the glory days, if you will, but my <laughs> arm, <laughs> my arm actually now uh, regrets it every time I, I try to throw a football or throw something with my right arm. So that being said, it was a lot of fun. I was very competitive, allowed me to travel. Um, college and university, went to the University of Evansville, so in Southern Indiana and studied communications. Was it Allowed a state college or private? Private, in, yeah, private, rough, I think right now it's around 2,500 students. Uh, it's a Methodist affiliated college, but it was, it was mainly focused around liberal arts. So I wanted to do something where I can be a jack of all trades, so I did communications. So I got my bas uh, Bachelor of Science in communications, but I have a creative side of me too. So I had a visual communications minor, but it allowed me to be in things like uh, fraternity involvement. Uh, I was in charge of giving like tours to prospective students. I did homecoming committee. I was like in a dance. In other words, you had to kind of sell the university, right? Yeah, I had to sell the university, um, but I was super involved. So I loved like talking with people. I love being able to, you know, try different things. I think that's what allows me to kind of like paved my path later on in life. Uh, so I was just very, I'm a talkative person. I love getting to know people and hearing other people's point of views. So throughout that time, you know, I dabbled in a couple of different things. Uh, I started in sales, selling Cutco cutlery. So actually- What did you sell, so, sorry, what was that? So Cutco cutlery, it's uh, like knives. Basically they're in New Cut? York. Well, what's the word you're saying? Cutco, C-U-T-C-O. Um, Cutco so I think cutlery, yeah. Yeah, I think they're in, only in New York, but they're like really high quality. Like, oh, Costco is another brand. Yeah, it's a brand. Almost so sounds like they, Costco. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah, it. almost like Costco. Uh, but the uh, so I when I was a senior in high school, I was selling these to people that I had just met. So I was I went through like a sales program and got to sell like almost door to door essentially with um, kitchen knives essentially. Uh, like and Ryan, you did this at the same like time that. you were still in school, or this is right after school. Yeah, after high school into college. So I did this for about two summers and it actually allowed me to pay for my study abroad uh, trip my sophomore year of college. So you I go was able abroad. To... Yeah, good question. It they have a sister school at our university called Harlickson College, which is in Grantham, England. And where where? Where in England? Grant Grantham. Grantham. So wow, Grantham, yeah, that? Grantham is about I think it's where Margaret Thatcher actually uh, grew up. Kidding. Um, about an hour's train ride north of London. So I, I traveled to 10 different countries while I was over there. Got to, that, that really opened up my, you know, my eyes to the world, basically getting to go to like Europe or like England, France, Germany, 
uh, Spain, uh, Netherlands. I went to Greece, uh, Italy. I, I was traveling as much and as often Fantastic. as I could. And over how, there, so. how long were you overseas? Uh, my whole year? Or? Uh, only about three and a half months. So three and a half every months weekend, to package all these countries. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm a little crazy. Or at least when I was uh, in college, I was crazy to do all that traveling. But it was like weekend trips, hop on a flight, do uh, a quick getaway holiday, if you will, and then come back on Sunday and hit the books hard and um, then on Thursday night, leave for a new country after that. And give so, us some perspective. What year was that when you were in uh, the UK? That was in 2009. So okay. I was about 11, yeah, uh, 12 years ago. Yeah, about 12 years ago. So I was supposed to travel abroad again, 2020, but we all know how that turned out. So mm-hmm. um, that's been put on hold uh, until, you know, whenever we can go abroad again. But yeah, that lo- really opened up my eyes to like different cultures, different, again, I'll talk probably a lot about perspective and it allowed me to kind of get other people's ideas on like perspective on like Americans, but also just like how people live their lives. And so it allowed me to kind of just broaden my horizons and allowed me to, you know, just grow as a human. So yeah, accept after, different, yeah. understand different cultures, different mindsets, different opinions, uh, different ways of life, something that just can't bend or change, even though you believe some way of life is a bit maybe better or more convenient. Still, they, they, you know, other people stick to their customers' traditions, traditions, uh, just because you know they have, you know, um, they have a commitment to it. So I think that really opens up your eyes, and especially when you go over to Europe, there's all these types of, um, you know, cultures going on with a lot of tradition and the arts and the crafts and the, you know, the dining. A yeah, lot the food. Of, uh, I mean, that that's where I think I get my food uh, palette now. Is just the food's amazing, especially when you know you have it firsthand instead of oh, like it's a restaurant or something trying to recreate it. It's just the atmosphere in general why I think a lot of people don't appreciate it, which is why I think so many Amazon sellers or people in this industry really like traveling because you get all these different kind of uh, components, if you will, to like broaden in your horizons and, and really just get a better experience. I think like you're not diversifying your own palette. You're not diversifying your own perspective. And that's why I think it's really important to travel and I'm a big advocate for it when you can. Fantastic. All right. So 2009, you travel, then you come back to the States, you finish your degree. Yep. Finished my degree. Um, you you know, graduated in Yeah. Uh, graduated in 2012. Um, so yeah, almost 10 years ago now. So nine years ago, mm-hmm. um, which seems like forever ago, but out of college, I, you know, started my, my, uh, first job in the newspaper industry, like I alluded to earlier, selling newsprint ads, digital display ads, SEM which options. newspaper at all kinds or was there a specific one? Yeah, it's a regional newspaper uh, down in Southern Indiana and in Southern Illinois, Northern Kentucky called uh, Evansville Courier and Press. They were owned by Ev- EW- Evans? Evansville Courier and Press. So Evansville Courier owned- Express. Okay, got it. Courier and Press. Yeah. So they were owned by the same company that does the spelling bee, EW Scripps. So if you, you see like the ki- little kids who are doing the spelling bee every year, it's the same company that does that. Um, so long story short, I was doing that for about two years, going door to door, trying to listen to different businesses and solutions, how to get them to stand out um, to this audience that we were speaking to as a solution. And then uh, like every aspiring uh, person right out of college, I was laid off in December of 2013. So yeah, so there for a year, a year and a half you were there? Yeah, a year and a half or so. And then... Um, yeah, I think it was 2013, 2014, and I got laid off. So I'm Oprah won right out of college, and I did a lot of soul searching. I'm young. I obviously was had a fiance at the time who was finishing up her degree. She was finishing up her degree in Connecticut, so we we're not close. Um, we were getting married in four months, and so I did a four lot months of, before you uh, got laid off. Uh, four months until we were going to get married. So yeah, yeah. so so yeah. so you got laid off. You're about to, you know, you were planning to get married four months afterwards. Yep. Yep. We right. were, we were planning to get married in Ohio and, you What's know, in Ohio? I, your family, her family, uh, her, her, yeah, her family, my family still lives in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, which is where they're from. But I, uh, yeah, it was kind of like one of those social searching things. Can we touch a little bit about the context of where you get, got laid off? Was this yeah. like an industry thing because, you know, print is yeah. shrinking or cause you know, yeah, I was, yeah. So I was, there was a couple of us in, in our division, but it was across the board, like writers were laid off, marketing and sales staff were laid off. 
And it was just like a random Wednesday. I had my schedule all laid out. I was going to start really selling solution. I wasn't doing bad. Like I was hitting goals and it wasn't a performance thing. It was just a, an industry thing. You saw it when you saw the reports on like profitability as an all company meeting when it's all red, that's never a good sign, I would think. So long story short, yeah, it's kind of a, a difficult thing. Uh, I would- Are they I would still in business, be, by the way? They're still in business? Yeah, they are. Uh, I think a lot of it shifted to digital, but they're on a more lean uh, staff, Structure. I would say. Yeah, I mean, I almost like never looked back. I kind of want to say, hey, I grew from that. I never want to be a part of that again because honestly, it sucked. But yeah. um, it was, I mean, it's a lot of hard work. You, you know, you're trying to sell a solution that isn't as viable anymore as it once was. So that, that was kind of a thing that I didn't buy into anymore. Um, so yeah, did a lot of soul searching, but luckily about a month went by, my wife got a job. She's a music therapist. So she uh, can get a job almost anywhere. Um, she got a job in a jail in Virginia um, on the East coast of the United States. So with me not having a job and she had a position, we both decided to get up and just move to a different state with no connections nearby, no family to support us. Uh, we just kind of jumped into this entrepreneurial journey start um, fresh for ourselves. Yeah. Start fresh almost, if you will. Um, so she got a job and then shortly a couple, like a, a month or two later, I found a position which got me into e-commerce with a company called Evergreen Enterprises. So they are a manufacturer and distributor of roughly 10,000 SKUs on a yearly basis. Um, manufacturing in Ningbo, China, and then they distribute out of their headquarters in Richmond. Ningbo so, is very big into hot pots and pans. Was this was kitchenware or, or everything? So it was home gift garden decor. Um, it was like uh, garden flags, garden stands, um, a lot of like more decorative items. And they were doing about 10,000 SKUs um, on a rotating like catalog, if you will, on seasonal decor. So selling to retail stores, but then they're also growing their e-commerce division um, selling directly to Fanatics, um, Wayfair, Zulily. Um, we were selling in Amazon FBA and FBM because we had our own warehouse system. And this was in 2014. And th they're uh, based out of Virginia? Yeah, they're based out of Virginia. They're still in business. Which um, part they of Virginia? Own, uh, Richmond. So oh, yeah. um, Big town, it's in yeah. the center. It's the capital. Yeah, Richmond. Mm -hmm. So I think they're in one of the suburbs, like Midlothian, I think. And they were growing their they were good directly to, uh, as a wholesaler, but they were trying to grow their direct to consumer portfolio. So there was a team of people selling to Amazon, basically directly putting goods in FBA and, uh, fulfilling, uh, sales from FBM in our own warehouse there in Richmond. So let me, and let then, me just understand. So on the Amazon level, yeah. you had one P three P or just three P third party selling. Uh, it would be, well, we had our own brands. So technically we were one P. So you're wholesaling uh, to Amazon. That's in the one we P level. Right. Yeah, and then we were also dabbling into some uh, three uh, three P as well. So as a wholesaler, it, it was kind of a weird mix because you could wholesale you as a wholesaler, you were selling to retail stores, and we had these stipulations in place where, hey, you couldn't sell below a certain threshold. Obviously, map map, and, map pricing, ma uh, manufacturer yeah. approved pricing, something like that. Yeah, exactly. So um, we had to always like make sure that those are being like if we were selling directly to those people and they were under undercutting our own uh you know systems and sales then we had to like shut them down as a, so we had this really weird dynamic of we had sales people selling to these people directly but also we were trying to sell on the same platform they were again a marketplace in general so it's a, a weird dichotomy if you will that you we guys were like out. a super hybrid because you got a brick and mortar yeah. wholesale one p wholesale to amazon and wafer and all the other uh e-commerce yeah. e retailers plus Third party selling, so doing DTC direct to consumer. Um, wow, that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, and then we also had our own branded website, which I was in charge of like running sales through. So it was literally uh, two websites that we aren't ex in existence anymore, but we built out. Um, it was a zero revenue uh, channel. We built it on Magento, I think, is with the platform. So I was in charge of basically building landing pages, trying to go to third party websites, almost like an influencer marketing, and say, hey, we'd love to showcase our products they're the lowest out there we love to offer deals and incentives and coupons for your um, audience you know how do we get our name out to your your members basically right. so it was up to me to kind of like work with ebates like the cashback um, they were still known as ebates that's how long ago it was now it's rakuten uh like bradsdeals.com 
uh, Deal News, which is really popular with a lot of Amazon sellers now. So it was so let me just get this straight. So 2014, you started with Evergreen, and the first position mm-hmm. they gave you was, you know, take care of our marketing e-com- manager. Yeah, exactly. So marketing was- manager on the website level on their dot uh, com, not any yep. any marketplace platforms, right? Yep, exactly. That, that, okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. It was it was definitely weird because it was a zero revenue channel, and I had to figure out how was I going to get a brand that didn't exist to in front of an audience that was massive enough to drive quick traffic. And how do I make enough a dent for them to continue to want to work with me? So it was offering commissions like the affiliate channel does, um, working with these big websites and saying, hey, this is our story. Um, We can offer best on website or best on the internet pricing, uh, but they also offer like things like free shipping and really kind of dived into the uh, consumer mindset of what they're looking for and seasonality. So it was me trying to test a bunch of different products with 10,000 SKUs at my disposal or ASINs at my disposal for Amazon sellers, which ones are going to yield the best results and be noticeable enough for people to want to buy a lot of. So it was a lot of testing, a lot of like seasonal. Like so, so hold on. So from the entire like catalog, you had to kind of identify which ones will be the, 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 the ones who was, are going to move the needle in terms of yep. bringing traffic and revenue into your .com website. Yep. And look at rep, and look at inventory levels, look at what we could sell it at. So I wasn't undercutting our own business just to, for the sake of a deal. If there was um, inventory levels that we just had to, that were just so bad that we had to get rid of, um, it was offering special deals and incentives. So it's almost like uh, we had our own inner workings ecosystem of what Amazon sellers go through on a day-to-day basis. I just didn't know that you as a third-party seller could do this. I was just doing it on a level where a multi-million dollar company can allow me to kind of tinker with stuff. So it was really cool to, to test it out on that level. How'd it go? But yeah. So uh, first year, I drove a zero sum revenue channel to six figures. I think it was like around $650,000 in revenue my first year doing How'd it. How'd it go? I knew nothing about the industry. It was just kind of a lot of testing and diving in. And the next year I did it, it we were around a million dollars, over seven figures in revenue. So more once I showed the value of like, hey, this is a viable channel, you can start getting the voice, like the, the respect so from all these other websites. Six figures in, in one year, and then second year is it was already, I know the seven figure, correct? Yeah. So I like to tout that, hey, I took a business and a brand that wasn't my own, but I took it to six and seven figure uh, revenue channel. So all before it was cool back in 2014, uh, the 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 old school days of. So 2014 was the six figure, and 2015 was already the seven figure. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, those are the years that I, I grew those channels. Um, and it was like, obviously watching the rest of my team kind of do the Amazon game of working with our manufacturers over in China when we have to plan out how much inventory to send it to different FBA facilities, how far in advance they had to do. And they were making their own special orders for certain selling products um, and working with the team of how we're going to brand uh, this website and this kind of entity to make sure that we didn't piss off or really ma- collide. Get, collide. yeah, basically our wholesaler uh, business, but then also our e-commerce business and where I fit in the middle. So we did a lot of like teamwork together of driving traffic in different ways, like through email marketing campaigns, through just sponsored deals, like paying ads and whatnot. I broke our website three different times because I sent so much traffic at once. So I got to learn about- Give us a, tra- a story of one of those instances. What happened? Give us a little- taste. Yeah. So my biggest uh, fan, and I like to tell this to Amazon sellers because there's so much value in these deal websites. I think at the the back end of what I learned through this process was I get to understand the psychology of what people look for in a deal. Um, when I'm a shopper, Everyone wants to get the best price out there, right? That's why a lot of people go to Amazon. When you think about it on e-commerce websites, what do people get triggered by? Free shipping, uh, some sort of coupon or discount, some sort of perk that says like, hey, all these add-ons, and then you also get this and this and this. We're really greedy people uh, is what I learned. But really trying to emphasize those highlights and then also at a good price point. And so I got to find out that, that really sweet spot of price points. Um, I worked with a combination a of a good price point, but also kind of bundling or packaging it up in a way where it's unique is differentiated. Yeah, for sure. And then making sure we had a good inventory level so that we can support enough sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wasn't just like a flash in the pan 20 sale and then it's out just like launching a new product. Um, 
So one of the websites I had a lot of success with is um, they're, they're still in business, uh, bradsteals.com. I think they operate out of Chicago and they tout best of web. They have a bunch of different publishers and work on uh, different e-commerce websites, but also with Amazon sellers. So you can feature different products that are applicable to their audience. They have a lot of, uh, their audience is really unique because they have email blasts that go, I think twice a day, or at least it was that if you're featured on this, you have this huge wave of uh, traffic to your website. And I'm talking like 10,000 people all of a sudden instantly on a listing. And that, that can tsunami, that load, go zero. Yeah, it's the tsunami basically of traffic. So they had this program called 60 Days of Deals where it's the 60 days around Christmas. It would be, uh, I think November 1st through December 31st, obviously, of just deals that are featured for the day and they're like best on web stuff that's applicable to the audience that people would buy a lot of and you have to have great inventory levels best of web pricing and free shipping so it's all so these when different they tell products. you inventory levels what it's a few hundred units a few thousand units a few ten thousand yeah so it depends on the deal and i would have to pitch my deal to them um and basically the best deal that we can give they would they would slot it on this like calendar of deals and this is like months in advance so i have to do my own forecasting i have to work with my team hey do we have these inventory levels so on and so forth and this deal I came up with is uh, Christmas ornaments that start at $3 and above. So it was kind of funny that uh, at a price point where it says $3 and above, people are like, oh, that's really cheap. And it's around Christmas time is a very good deal. Not everything was $3, but that's where it started at. Um, and it, so the this benchmark was, like, was very alluring for them to click in and then they can see yeah. the deal, but then discover more. Yeah. And it, it wasn't like clickbait, but it was almost like, hey, we do have stuff that is available at that, but it's over a course of, I think we had like 500 different ornaments you can choose from. They were licensed ones too. So you have like college ones that people are fanatics over. You had different, not customizable, but you had just all these different kinds of options basically for people to choose and like, hey, my favorite team might be in here. Um, so you created so a they, real level, almost like this one-stop shop for the ornaments, right? Yeah, exactly. So I built out this landing page that all like people didn't have to go find it. I had pointed them all directly to right to this place. And I turned on Google Analytics and I just watch it. I, I was accepted to be on the Sunday before Chris, uh, before Black Friday, which is by industry standard, the third largest uh, shopping day of the year before 2020 happened. But like traditionally, it's the third largest volume um, of the year. So this so is one pretty, week before Thanksgiving weekend. Which one week before Friday. Thanksgiving. Yeah. So we were fulfilling people are on holiday, uh, fulfilling orders and stuff like that. And it's on a Sunday. So no one's in the office. It's me for my laptop from, I would think of this weekend. I was, I was in North Carolina with visiting my wife who happened to be down there. And, um, and we, I was just like on my laptop watching and like any Amazon seller, you just watch sales trickle in, but this I was watching year 215. Or yeah, 20, uh, this would have been 2015. Yeah. Right. So December, 2015. Mm -hmm. And then I knew exactly, I had timed it when the email gets triggered. Uh, that's how analytical I was. I knew when it would launch so I could watch it and time myself, had my team ready. I was like, Hey, we're going to so get it's almost like uh, launching uh, an aircraft into space. <laughs> you're at the command center waiting for the I was counting down. To launch and you're exactly. sitting on your dashboards. Yeah. Exactly. So I was watching this and I was like, guys, like I, I have this built out. I kept prepping everyone. It's going to be bad. It's, it's going to be a lot of people. And they're like, oh, we'll handle it. It's not a big deal. We only had one developer who could support us on our back end because we we're a small team at the time. And once the email hit, I go, all right. And I clicked it over and I just see instantaneously, I think I hit 2000 people on my one, one uh, page at once. And then all of a sudden it goes down to zero and I go, what the, what the hell? Basically I start freaking out. I go to the page. I was like, is the link broken? Is the website broken? What's happening? I <laughs> come to find out that the landing page had suffered so much traffic. I want it overloaded our system and it didn't allow for anyone to even connect to it. Wow. So I'm on the phone with my developer. I go, what the hell's going on? All these people can't get to our website. We're missing sales like instantaneously as I'm speaking. And I think two hours went by, I'm getting emails from this company. They're like, Hey man, what the hell? This is a big deal. We can't convert on this stuff um, just like you can't. And uh, all these problems are happening. And like two hours went by and I, then we finally got it back up and running. It had to have been rough round 30 grand day. It was pretty intense. Like for three to 
fifteen dollar, you know. But items. that was your tuition. So the next time you did it, and the next two times you did it, you were so well prepared. Hopefully, you made it up. Yeah, right. we we had uh, invested in some more server space. Um, we did a lot of load testing. Uh, there was a lot of testing, and I said, "Are we sure that this is going to scale appropriately?" And it, it and it worked. Um, and those are the things that you learn as you grow. Is you don't think that there is this big wave that you can not right. manipulate traffic, but almost like the power of one platform on one deal on one blast. Just like I would say TikTok with some of these sellers who are saying like one feature can yield in tens of thousands of sales just because of one feature. Right? Everyone sees it. They yeah, have when to you, have it yeah, when for can some you, reason. When you can hone in on where you know the demand is, is sitting and you can target it properly and you introduce your product solution to that demand, it's in a beautiful explosion on the digital space. Uh, but of course, uh, yeah, you have to have the right rocket fuel and the right infrastructure to um, to bear the stress uh, and not cave under uh, the stress test uh, components of it. Yeah, um, pretty sure I lost good. a couple of years of my life on uh, on those deals. Um, my wife was just saw, watched me pacing back and forth. It, I mean, it's like any Amazon seller on those kind of uh, Black Friday, Prime Days, where you're like my listing gets taken down for any reason or anything like that. It's you had all these steps that you've built out month and then weeks in advance and something that's out of your hands, such as like hosting website traffic on a landing page that you built out and you triple checked. It, it, it's just one of those things that something's always going to come up. You have to be prepared for everything. So yeah, but that you, was, uh, you, you guys sucked it up and continued and it seems like you were still on the right path for success. So it wasn't, uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah, a meltdown. So I, <laughs> I mean, when I walked in on Monday after all that traffic and our warehouse, I was, I came in and I had a couple of people standing by my desk and go, Ryan, let me tell you that we have more orders today than we have ever seen this whole year on one day. And our, our warehouse is basically in a fury right now trying to fulfill these orders before Thanksgiving and Christmas, because people will need to, we are fulfilling by merchant on our website. Um, so I walked back to our warehouse and was just watching these furies of people picking ornaments and packing them up in small boxes, shipping them out. And everyone was going bananas. So I, was, I felt, I felt you moved pretty, a little, that was you. Yeah, you I moved that, a needle. Yeah. Well, my CEO then uh, learned my name. Um, and I got to sit <laughs> out of his office for the rest of uh, the year and the time I was there. So nice. it was definitely a unique experience to kind of see like, Hey, I did it for one product. What if I did it for, you know, 10 or 20 products. And then I started becoming involved in like one-on-one -on -one conversations with like distressed inventory that we had to move. How do we make this look like a, a perceived value in a deal? And it was a deal. Um, like you can retail it at a hundred bucks, but you can sell it for 35. That was another thing. It was like, I could, I could find all these like unique products, just looking through this catalog of inventory and like products that might speak to an audience and then really speak to them quickly and efficiently. So that's, that was kind of like my learnings when I was there. So I did that for about two years uh, or so. And then my wife and I wanted to relocate back to the Midwest um, to be closer to family because she lives in, uh, her family is in Cleveland area. My family's in uh, just north of Indianapolis. So wherever someone got a job <laughs> was the next place we were gonna live. So two days later, my wife got an offer I, I'm always following my wife for some reason. That's um, great. It's a good marriage. And uh, yeah, it's uh, so she got a good job uh, quickly in Indianapolis, which is where we currently live. Was it a um, jail again or no? Not not in jail. So she yeah she uh, works for a nonprofit called Noble and does music therapy with um, with uh, people who have mental uh, deficiencies. So basically, like with like um, people who have speech impediments or any sort of kind of disabilities where they can't converse through, uh, you know, speech or communicate well, they using music as a form to express emotions and whatnot. Um, that's, great. that's, that's what she works with people. Yeah. So it's, she's doing that remotely now, um, over zoom. So it's a little hard to, to have people like stay focused on a camera, but she's above me. So if you hear music in the background, that's, that's me and her, <laughs> that's her above me, uh, working away. Um, and you guys live in, yeah, in, she, in Indianapolis or yeah, so yeah, we live in Indianapolis, or uh, technically in Westfield, which is a suburb north of Indianapolis. But she got a job here. We bought our first home here, and I tried to tell my company back in Virginia, "Hey, I would love to work remotely." I'm, I'm Hold on, when you moved, it was which year was that? 2016 already? Yeah, 2016 already. Okay. Um, and I was looking for ecom work uh, because my company said, "Hey, we would need you to be here. We need to converse with you in person. I think it would change now." 
uh, if, if we were talking about in 2020, then it was back in 2014 or 2016, excuse me. Mm-hmm. But um, so I was like, okay, like, I guess I can't work remotely. I had been doing it uh, for a couple of days here and there, but full time, it wouldn't work for them. So I actually took a departure from the e-commerce industry and I worked for the NBA and the WNBA for two and a half years. No kidding. Uh, the, wow. The NBA, yeah, the Indiana Pacers and Indiana Fever. Um, they're both, uh, I worked as a group events manager. So basically selling tickets and working with different organizations to come out to the game and hosting them in the arena, whether it was, you know, for the game or for a special like event. Um, I was great. How'd you get to that? What was the point of connection there? Uh, it was random. I never met the people in person. It was all done through zoom. I interviewed back in 2016. Yeah. So zoom Zoom or like, you're just saying, (laughs) uh, well, I was trying to think Skype, whatever. it would have been probably Skype back then. Yeah, for got sure. It, got it. Okay, um, just to make sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. So they, they, a lot of it was done over the phone. I was, I had a sales background. I had this ability to like adapt and grow and like t- take an industry I didn't know and like hit the ground running. And so they were like, Hey, we love your expertise in sales and marketing. This would be a good fit. Um, and they kind of just like offered it to me on the spot. I, I would say if I had to do it again, it would be, I think I would try it differently. Just but you didn't work think, for the league. You work for the franchise, right? The Pacers yeah, the and the... Yeah, the Indiana Fever. So the WNBA Fever. team, the women's team, yeah. So they're, I, they're I, both owned by the same um, owners, essentially? Yeah. So the owners of the Pacers and the Fever are the Simons. So they own Simon Property Realty, which oh, is... Oh, wow. Yeah, the all malls. All the malls. Yeah, yeah the giants. malls. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they are... Look, their headquarters is here in Indianapolis, but they have, like, obviously retail stores, which is, yeah, I think the largest, second today. largest in, uh, in America in terms of uh, shopping yeah. malls. Uh, I think they emerged with GGP, a uh, growth crop, uh, uh, something growth prop or uh, GPP uh, or GGP. I forgot. Uh, general growth uh, yeah, properties. Tar- yeah. They, so they do a lot. Yeah. It, like in terms of like shopping malls, but also like outlet stores and, and malls yeah. and whatnot. But uh, I met the owner in person. I met his son who is going to inherit like this billion dollar entity. And they're like nice people and it's cool as a part of professional sports, you get to meet like the players who are normal people. They're just a lot taller than you are. I'm five seven, <laughs> so I'm super short. And when you have a seven footer um, walking past you, it's, it's really weird and daunting. Um, but it's really cool. Like you get to go behind the scenes. Um, you work with concerts here coming through the building. Um, just a lot oh, of people. Because you guys who, own the venue. So you also, they did more business through just selling, yeah. uh, selling out so the venue as a, as a stadium. Yeah, our offices were in this... Uh, I'm trying to think of how big i think it's like 18,000 people arena so wow. you can go as high as like the raptors where like these mascots will rappel down to the floor you can go behind the bleachers and like go behind the scenes you get to meet like you know icons that are in the game right now um but it, it was all like think about it this way so you have a nine to five job you're talking on the phone all day with organizations trying to come out to the game and then you at five o'clock, then you have dinner there at the venue, and then there's a game that night. So then you're working till 11 p.m. at night with people, and that's on a normal day today. If there's no overtime or any other sort of, you know, business that has to happen, or like after the game events going on, because some organizations will rent the floor after a game and shoot around. You have to be there the whole time with them and represent the, the uh, the company. So. It was really hard in terms of like life balance. You were you were there constantly. It was consuming, uh, right? So you're saying yeah, it was very very consuming, it's, demanding, it's taxing, it's consuming. You know, I think it's you put a lot of work in, but uh, in an industry where it's hard to grow and there's it's a lot of like not a lot of upward mobility. I think that was something that was rough for me. But I like to I like loved working with the people. I loved the you know human partnership aspect of everything and just knowing how businesses run. It gives Did you it feel a little bit of a climactic, uh, basically engaging on the phone, a lot of the, you know, of, of the whole things going on, but then it comes to physical events and then you see the magic happening with your own eyes. Was that, was there like a thrill in that at all? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe yeah. Thrill. Because like I've had people come up to me like, oh my gosh, like I didn't think we'd be able to shoot around on a professional basketball floor before. I mean, to me, I'm like, I can walk on it whenever I want, like I'm, take a phone call and I'm sitting in the arena and most people have to spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars just to go to a game in general. So it's kind of cool to like work there, meet people there and like have this entity as your at your disposal and then kind of like sell yourself through this entity. Like, hey, we can do a pregame like cocktail hour here or we can do all these other types of events. What if I told you 
you know, both basketball teams can have a game on the floor before the actual NBA game or a WNBA game later that night. And they would be able to watch the professionals play on the floor later on. Like it was kind of painting a picture in a visual. So you're context. focused on bundling things. Uh, I mean, so what was the main purpose for you just to keep selling the stadium yeah. or, or a uh, group. So group events. So anytime there was 10 or more people involved, that was my forte. It wasn't like going to a season ticket holder and saying, Hey, I have these tickets for you for seven or uh, what 40 something games every year. This is the price, like use them for business development, whatever. There was different like things like partnerships. You had business development reps, you had corporate uh, ticket sales. I was in, I was around the group uh, events and specifically for the WNBA. I, that's where I did a lot of my focus was during the summer when the women played talking like with women events and trying to get them out to the game during the summer, working with uh, like summer camps and whatnot, because we had like a kid's day. So I get to touch like organizations all across the board, which was really fulfilling. Nice. Um, and got to kind of like bring a light that otherwise these kids might not be able to come to a game ever. Um, so you do like discounts and things like that too. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun while I did it. It was definitely a unique perspective, but I was really hankering to get back into the e -com game. So and this was, is already was, 2018 or 2019, this uh, time frame I, where you're about to I pivot wanted, out. Yeah, I wanted to pivot out in 2018, like, but 2019 is kind of when everything kind of really started to paint its own path, path, uh, path for me, I should say. Mm -hmm. So um, in the Amazon space, a lot of people know like the Helium 10s, the Jungle Scouts and other service providers. There's another one that's here actually in Indianapolis called Viral Launch, which I'm assuming yep. you know who they are. So Casey Goss. Casey, and, right? Casey, right? Yeah. Yep, Casey uh, and his team, they founded Bar Launch here. Gosh, that would have been 2016 or 2015. Uh, and I, I was trying to keep my ear to the tech scene and kind of figure out what, how I wanted to get back into the space. And I saw they had a position for partnerships and affiliate marketing. And I was removed for a couple of years, but met with Casey, um, thought they had a fantastic product and service. I wanted to hop in and just say, like, I want to hit the ground running and understand how to help this company grow. And I was hired that week. It was a really quick process. It, anything in tech or SaaS related or any type of like uh, tech company, I feel like it moves pretty quickly if the right people get involved. So it was cool to see uh, them see value in me from that perspective, knowing like I could draw from those past experiences, but not know all, everything about Amazon. So right from the get go, I had to start working with like our influencers and partners, how to- This is already 2019, uh, early, mid? This was, I'm trying to think, Viral Launch would have come early, I want to say May or April. I want to say April of 2019. Maybe gotcha. May, maybe May oh. or so. But I ended up Close being there mid, for about, yeah. yeah, I wanted to, I was there about 11 months or so, like through this whole wave of like, you know, the growth, uh, the growth that we had, and then gotten to see a lot of like new launches, like with our PBC software. Um, cash back in terms of launching solutions. I got to have a lot of conversations with sellers and service providers and really pick their brain, like how we can partner together and really try to sell viral launch from that perspective. Um, but I got, uh, got to meet a lot of cool people, um, both in person, but, uh, virtually as well. And then, you know, there, there is a time where, um, the company had to like release a lot of people, I think with a lot of, uh, tech companies, you have this massive growth. And then if things don't work out, then you have to, then you obviously see everything scale back. So there was a scale back process from viral launch that happened. What happened? What was, what was the, yeah, was, give us a little bit of an uh, explanation or context to what, what happened to viral launch um, as far as you perceive it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was there. I was not a person that was, um, uh, that was, um, part, I was still there when everything kind of happened, but I think in any business when you can, uh, trying to think of like the yeah, but what happened just i'm not i'm not too familiar yeah to be honest, oh so. yeah yeah so, so very yeah, successful so, and I mean, yeah well. super successful and then like i think with an industry if you stretch yourself too thin i think there's the ability that if you're trying to be a service and a software and then all these other things that keep adding on to that it's hard to support with manpower because i think that's the most expensive entity that you can invest in so there was a direction that like the business wanted to go and then the direction that our leadership team wanted to go. So, so, so let's, touch think, the, let's touch the elements here, right? So the main purpose of our launch or the core competency was X and then they tried to add YZ and, and so forth. Yeah. So touch about that a little bit. So, we understand. so yeah, when you add on like software tools, 
uh, you know, you have to, any kind of software tool, you have to pay to support those systems. If it's a research tool, for example, like this is for any research tool out there, you have to pay for like access server space, being able to keep tools updated and you have manpower to help with those services, um, whether it's running campaigns or whether it's running uh, the software itself or being a customer service rep or being a salesperson, all those things kind of come with the cost and you have to make sure that your revenue obviously exceeds uh, other costs. That being said, like that's with any business, that's just right. the whole business. Problem. What was you the money only... maker for our launch? What was the core core product, core solution or core, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, it's the, uh, the it's golden the core egg. tool. Yeah. The core tools, I would say uh, keyword research, product discovery. I would say it's pretty much using the data that Amazon has available and consumers that are starting to sell on Amazon, break it down into a fact like, Hey, that's a micro niche where I can jump into. And that's something that was super valuable for people because People need that to be successful from the get-go. I think there's a certain point where software tools aren't needed by sellers because they know like what's working for them, but they kind of ebb and flow. You have to constantly find ways and features to keep an Amazon seller um, engaged with your brand, whether it's using your so, tools. So as far as the so the market research tool was the claim to fame and the growth engine for, for the company to explore. Yep. What you're saying? Yep. After that, once you know, kind of you do market research, you put your product in the game, you find success, you can then detach. So that creates, uh, I yep. guess, a uh, churn or something. Uh, yeah, turnover. churn. Uh, the lifetime value of a customer isn't as long as somebody. If you're, you know, almost like a. I'm trying to think of a good one. Maybe like if you have like a subscription to Netflix, like whatever. PPC tool or Netflix. Yeah, exactly. Like Netflix, I'm not going to just get rid of it. Like they're going to upcharge me another two dollars. Yeah, I'm going to take it because. I always it's a constant want the new feed, content. constant feed, yeah. yeah, constant feed, yeah. So that's why you see a lot of new tools and features come out from like the competitors. You always want to have people that are constantly engaged and improve either the interface or a tool function, anything like that. I think that's the tricky, the trickiness of right. And even what not the just, company closed down or they they uh, no the company still exists. I think uh, yeah. So when you just have too many like the in terms of they had to let people go. I mean, that's, that's pretty public. Yeah, knowledge. Downsize, yeah. yeah. They had to downsize because you have to get back of, you have so much revenue and then you have to, you know, you can only have so many people to not exceed revenue costs and be profitable. So that being said, they, I think it was like, I forget how many people, but then there was like a group of us, the skeleton crew is what we called ourselves was. Which crew, which team. crew, what was the name? Oh, uh, like the people, I call it skeleton crew. So like oh, people skeleton, are like, got it. Yeah, skeleton, yeah, yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. So I would say, um, my microphone's all of a sudden dipping. Look Sorry, at keep it dipping. It's all right, we, we don't mind. Um, the, so in terms of like, oh, I'm going to leave it there. Um, in terms of the other stuff that was going on. So I think there was like 15 or so of us left that went, you have a big company of like 70 or so. And then you go down to 15, you look around and you're like, all right, I guess I'm taking on more responsibilities and what are we going to do now? So there was a, it was an interesting, weird time because it happened right before a lockdown in 2020. So the COVID hit when the pandemic yeah, broke COVID up. hit. And then you're like, we're all of a sudden working from home. And then everyone's trying to figure out this pandemic going on, you know, this happened with our company. Um, we were still, you know, moving forward, uh, trying to find our way in the space. And then, uh, I know a friend of yours, uh, actually reached out to me, um, Tim Jordan, who, uh, mm. I've never met before in my life. I was like, I don't know who this person is reaching out to me on LinkedIn. He, he reached out and he goes, Hey man, like hurts about some stuff going on. would love to talk to you. I think there's a good opportunity for you in the space uh, with this company called ping pong. And I was like, I am not into like table tennis or anything like that. <laughs> like, I'm not like, I don't know who you are, man. No, I was just kidding. Um, I like heard of good things and I've known the space. He had talked to a couple of partners who I've worked with and said like, Hey, your name came up a couple of times Thought you'd be a good fit for the space. And so we kind of talked through it all. And this was like January, February, around like the beginning of COVID uh, before it hit the United States. And then, uh, you know, they, they wanted me in this role that I'm currently in and I was hired on. And then, uh, you know, kind of the rest is history. I've kind of like paved my way into working with a FinTech company now, which is working with Amazon sellers and e-commerce sellers, but on an international level. So it started like really small for one business. And then I broke it up into like Amazon sellers. Now it's e-commerce and international growth. So my understanding of e-commerce game has like significantly haloed into this, this big understanding across all these different um, Give us a little rundown of, of, the, of the spectrum of e-commerce. So just to give us some context. 
Yeah. Um, so I just think it's, I think what we saw in 2020 has been crazy how it sped up where I saw it back in 2014 when I got into this game and I was like, what is FBM, FBA, all this stuff like in the back of my mind, I was like, that's interesting. You know, not thinking like an individual can do that, like a business could. And I was like, that's really cool. And I wouldn't shut up about it. Like I was always glued to analytics. I was glued to deal sites. I was like, all these different shopping behaviors you see every year, it's going to continue to grow 50%, 75%, triple digit growth year over year over year. And I was like, this is so hot. Like, I don't think it's ever going to go away. And I, and I started thinking to myself, I was like, all of a sudden we've hit this notion in society where shopping online is no longer a luxury. It's now a necessity. And I saw that path really start to develop. Like, I think, you know, you would agree with me. Like when we first start, started selling online shopping, you were like, oh, that sounds like a, I don't know if I want to get my credit card to a website. I don't know if I want to like trust that it's going to be delivered to my doorstep i want to like hand hold it out safely from this retail store to my car so it safely gets yeah there was definitely a psychological barrier who's on the other side where is this all going to yeah right and then like and then knowing that it can get to you from around the world it, it kind of it was this weird like psycho event that everyone just kind of got used to it all of a sudden and now it's instantaneously now it's a necessity like my family couldn't probably COVID. exist without like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, COVID, COVID no, you're stuck hit. at home. The only way for you to yeah. consume anything is online. I did, I did my first like online shopping <laughs> or for groceries during COVID. And I was like, this is so weird to not like be able to touch and feel like your produce. But then like through different kind of testing, I was like, man, you can really innovate in this way, or you can really enhance this sector in this way. If you could like feel or video or text and chat. And like, that's where like, all these companies kind of really shown like Instacart or like Uber Eats and things like that, where they're really Gosh. growing. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's kind of where I was seeing it kind of go. And we sped up five, even some people said 10 years in terms of like where everyone is using adoption, adoption. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, and that's the thing is I saw that in the United States, like I, I alluded to this earlier, like the cultural concept, it hasn't, even hit close to its potential internationally either. And I say this of like in marketplaces like Mexico or Amazon sellers in like India, for example, where billions of people are, um, they're just starting to get into, the, I say it, the, they, Amazon is just starting to get into these marketplaces where you will see in two, I would say two plus years, maybe less, you're going to start to see this, very strong. It, penetration is going to be huge. But like these other marketplaces already exist, just sellers aren't very aware of it. Amazon.com is by far and away like the biggest one, and that's the easiest one to get into. But you will start to see this growth internationally, I think, uh, in the years ahead where, you know, my my product is, has a, a place in society around the world. It's not just to the 300 million plus people in the United States. It's billions of people around the world. And how am I going to get my product to people you know, in Africa or in South America or in Russia or wh wherever your these marketplaces emerge, and with technology kind of like adapting as we did in 2020, it's gonna just be amazing to see the technical technological advancements that we're gonna see on a global uh, scale. So that that's kind of where I see everything. Yeah, I love that. I think that's great. The ability to cater, obviously, domestically, <clears throat> you know, selling in the U.S. You're a U.S. based seller. You know, that's it's a pretty strong environment. But uh, tuning in to outside of the world, you know, everything that's available there in these expanding markets is going to be the next chapter in this decade, probably a new decade, new chapter, right? So 2020 yeah, until 2030. <laughs> it, was a, it was a rough chapter, but I think we're like, all right, now I got yeah, to start with the dip, but, but actually that dip in terms of maybe travel, hospitality created a spike in the e-commerce field, right? On a global level. So um, yeah, it's absolutely. almost like a jump start, right? Like, uh, like electric when you saw the innovate, and you see innovation come from like any sort of like negative. You see lots of people like what modern medicine's doing right now is kind of baffling to people. Yeah, it takes like 10, 15 years to uh, create a vaccine. It took them a year. Why? They're able to collectively group together all these scientists from around the world and collaborate. And you know, when when I say 10 to 15 years, is because when you were doing it like uh, 50 years ago, you have to send a letter, or a document, or a research document via you know, FedEx or DHL or post office and reaches them, they write it or until they type it or whatever, and then they send it back and stuff like that. So everything instantaneously, they can do the test results on the spot with Zoom or whatever they need. Uh, just 
So it speeds up all the logistics around it uh, to to nothing, to immediate on yeah. the spot. So and I th- yeah, and then even seeing like how businesses, like the roll-up companies, like I use a term like as a very general one that you know everyone can relate to, but just seeing all the emerging ones that come from this kind of era and like how the next wave of business is going to yield is kind of really funny to hear because I always speak to like Amazon brokers and business brokers like, hey, we've been around for a while, but now all of a sudden it just shone this light on this industry where like, holy cow, this asset that I have built out as a as a private label uh, seller, all of a sudden I have an asset at my disposal, like a, like a house or like a car, I could resell it. And like can, a real business. Not I can make a, that. I yeah, can real make, business. yeah, exactly. That has a lot can, of value, intrinsic value, yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be uh, just my goods. It can be my brand. It can be my uh, solutions. It can be how, yeah, my trademarks. All of those things have value, and it never was shown in that way before. And now it is. And now all of a sudden, you have these like trailblazers like burning this path, and you have people who will innovate behind it. it it's just all these different businesses um, that you'll see. I even think like logistics companies will even um, yeah, develop. Okay. New, yeah, exactly. Because you saw it, like there's just like big clog up right now of how to get goods to from one place to another. But how do we like alleviate some of those pressures, not just with Amazon, but just like in general, like how do you get vaccines across the world in a quick, timely fashion? People are going to start relying on each other. So that's where kind of e-commerce is going in general is on a global perspective. How do you, how do you expand outside just your own little tiny bubble? Right. Love it. All right. So um, thank you so much for sharing your short story so far. I'm going to do a little quick uh, recap to kind of see if we got it all together right. Around yeah. 2009, you graduated. 2010, you started. 2012, you started out of college. You started your own um, position in uh, marketing with the um, you know, um, publication with newspapers and you did about a year and a half. And around 2014, you uh, moved to uh, Virginia where you started a position with um, uh, Evergreen where they're into e-commerce. It's about two years. You jump started their uh, dot com own website business uh, into uh, the six to seven figures, and then you switched into um, into uh, the state of home state of uh, Indiana currently, right? And yep. uh, you dive into actually, um, I guess, entertainment business for lack of a better um, um, you know uh, term, right? When you, there's yep. a venue, there's a stadium, there's a there's uh, you know, sports events and uh, cultural events that you uh, you uh, help uh, sell on a larger scale for for especially for groups. You do that for about two and a half years, and then um, you know this team of viral launch. They're around your neighborhood and you know the Indiana uh, space. Um, you tag it along, and you have almost a year there, where it was um, you know from a booming company, it actually experienced uh, a wind down. Um, and uh, and then 2020, uh, opportunity docs in with the form of Tim Jordan that connects you with um, Ping Pong Payments. And then um, you know, and, and then that year of 2020 was a phenomenal growth for all across for the whole industry. Uh, and this is where you are today, serving the community, the growth, the potential. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's been uh, phenomenal and um, fascinating for me to learn and study. Uh, okay, so I want to finish up the episode with two components. The first one will be is if somebody wants to reach out to you to learn more and, and connect, where can they find you? And the last thing will be, um, what is, I guess, your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah. Uh, so people can get in touch with me. Obviously my email would be, uh, best it's Ryan. So R Y A N dot Kramer and that's C R A M E R not like uh, Cosmo Kramer, like on Seinfeld, but, uh, C R A M E R at ping pong X dot us. Um, or I'm on social media. Obviously that's another way you can message me directly, like either on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, I, I respond on all channels. Um, if you spam me, I'll just delete it. But if it's a person who wants to answer questions, you're an equal I'm re- opportunity responder. I'm an e- all, yeah, all, exactly. All like I'll give you, if you, if you spur me, like burn me once, then I'll just block you. And that's not a big <laughs> deal. But if you're like, Hey, saw you on, you know, with Yoni, uh, had a couple of questions about it. I'm all ears. I will talk to you. I'm up at random hours of the day because as a global enterprise, we have to constantly be aware of what's going on around us. But uh, I would say my tip for inspiration, uh, I'm on the same path, or we're on the same wavelength, for inspiration, I would say just kind of be open to new opportunities. I think it's always going to be, if you're close up from the get-go, you're never going to be, it could be like this great opportunity present itself. And if you just completely are not open to learning about it, or just trying to realize that, hey, I don't know all the answers, but I'm willing to learn about it, that there could be something as crazy as growing in the e-commerce industry, uh, 
you know, from my own personal path, that this is the journey that I took. I was something I had no prior history on. I was just willing to learn and I needed to work my butt off to understand all these different terms, these different uh, capabilities of what e-commerce meant in general. And I just continue to dive, dive into it and absorb as much information as I can. I will 100% admit to everyone, I don't know everything. I haven't even sold on Amazon yet, but with my own experiences has allowed me to put that myself in seller's shoes and I can sympathize it because I've done it in different capacities. So even though it's not the same as me, like buying and having my own goods, I've done it for big multi-million dollar businesses. And then also I can understand the backside of what problem solving for other Amazon sellers and e-commerce sellers and what they go through. I always think you have to sympathize and understand from their perspective in order to problem solve for other people in the future. If I'm just going to shove my own solution down your throat, you're just going to naturally keep it and say like, no, thank you and reject it, even though it might be a good fit. I'm on the same page. Uh, if you scratch my back, I'm going to scratch yours and vice versa. That's how partnerships work. So be open to opportunity and be willing to learn and grow and, and kind of change as, as you see fit. Love it. Beautiful. So keep an open mind, uh, be honest. Uh, if something's good for you, embrace it, immerse in it. Don't be afraid of it. And hopefully you'll reach uh, new, new destinations and new heights, especially in this booming industry. Phenomenal. Very good. Ryan, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. I hope everybody that listened also enjoyed this as well. Uh, until next time, stay safe and healthy. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.